Hello, and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network, where we dive deep into Wabo's most reflective work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. That's me, and we are back to talk about Malfeasance 1111. Make a wish. It's the hundredth chapter. It's yes, the, it's the hundredth chapter. Nice. Yes, I understand that reference now. I've been I've been googling between between recording sessions, and I now understand what the hell you're talking about. Apparently, yep. I had missed this. Yep. Um, there's so so many unmade wishes. Um, yeah, I feel robbed. Yep. Um, Every yeah, day anyway, you get a whole wish. Chapters. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. We're uh, man. We're getting we're getting some serious progress through this uh, through this book. Um, for for eleven eleven, Blake has wished for more reflective surfaces, and his wish is granted by Peter, who has filled the house with water. Um, and it causes Ava, who is a witch hunter still in the house, in case you've forgotten since our last episode. Uh, it causes Ava to really react quite scared. Uh, she 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 backs off and kind of really gives this water a wide berth because she's still not quite sure of Blake's limits. Yeah, I mean he has reached out and stabbed at her a couple of times, so I think it's pretty justified caution. Mm. Yeah, no, I think so. Um, and Blake starts this chapter by thinking, when mum and dad come home, they're going to be so, with multiple O's, mad. Um, which is an interesting first <laughs> thought. I mean, like, I, I get I get that it's kind of a joke, but Blake can't lie. So you have to take this with at least <laughs> some element of truth. And it is true. But it just, I don't know, it, I, I'm just kind of like, it just gives me this vibe of Blake losing the plot a little bit. That he would think this. Well, he doesn't say it. He just—he's allowed to lie to himself. Like, internally, <laughs> no, right? like, well, he, true. He doesn't say it. He can but... be sarcastic in his head. <laughs> it's true, but I kind of like, you know, do you ever do that thing, Elliot? Or maybe this is just me, where you you're alone and you say a joke out loud and then laugh to yourself. Um, because I do that sometimes, and that's what Blake is doing here, basically. And it's the thing that yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not the most like hinged thing to do <laughs> no that's fair that's fair um i mean it's funny my actual first thought w- on reading this was like he could have been talking about rose because that's that's been my concern is like how rose is going to react when she comes back oh, and sees right. what's happened to the house yeah and uh, i i that's what he thought of like he he views m- rose in the same way he views his <laughs> mum and dad because uh, we know he doesn't have the highest opinion of his mum and his yeah, dad. So I, I think really like that. I really like that interpretation. That's great. Um, I also wanted to call out one thing Blake thinks to himself a bit later as, as things are sort of heating up, where he, uh, he thinks, if we took too long, if Andy got to my friends, if Alexis wasn't okay, if one of my friends would hurt, dying, or dead, I didn't like the feeling that took hold of me as I thought on that subject. And I mean, obviously, we've talked ad nauseum about Blake's, uh, you know, boogeyman tendencies. And this feels like him really starting to be aware of one, at least one instance where that's happening. Like the this scary thought that he doesn't even name is just like you can tell that the idea of them being hurt or dead is is like causing him to snap on some level. And I'm very scared of what might happen if if that does happen. Mm um yeah Uh, there's these parts in this chapter where ava is kind of like taunting blake with the knowledge that his friends might be dead and it's interesting Mm. he actually reacts more coldly than i was expecting i mean i maybe he doesn't really believe it which is kind of the case it's kind of unclear whether he believes it at the start of this or towards the middle of this chapter but he doesn't he doesn't let himself think about it, which is a classic Blake strategy of dealing with something uncomfortable is just move on to the next problem that you have mm. to solve. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's exactly what he does here. But uh, I mean, again, I just feel like the, the story's starting to lay more explicit. Uh, you know, Blake has this boogeyman living inside him right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's just getting more and more sort of drawn out for us. Uh, hope we're not going anywhere too dark with it. <laughs> we'll see, I guess. Um, so Ava uh, uh, kind of continues to talk to Blake in order to keep him around so that he can't kind of run off to fight Andy. And they're caught in this weird kind of stalemate where neither of them can really leave the other alone because they're too worried about what they'll do to the the uh, less or the more vulnerable members of their group. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because Blake thinks of it the whole time as like, I've got to keep Eva here or she's going to go after Peter. And it's very clear from everything that everything she's saying that Eva is thinking she's got to keep Blake down here or he's going to go after Andy. Yeah. Um, which is what ends up happening. Uh, but yeah, it's just funny that both of them think they're keeping the other one busy from the looks of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, and as they talk, there are some really interesting tidbits that are dropped. Um, and and the one yeah. I quite like the most is Andy has said to Ava that it's hard being a boogeyman, like that it's emotionally hard is the vibe that I got. And mm. this is not only a level of empathy that we I didn't expect from Andy, but it other than Blake, I can't think of a practitioner that has displayed empathy for boogeymen, right? Um, like, that's not a thing that they normally do. And obviously, Andy is not a practitioner. He's a witch hunter. But, you know, it kind of feels the same. Um, I, I I, don't know. It just, it was interesting to me that this is something that Andy thinks about. I mean, look, the cynic in me says, well, yeah, you've got to know your enemy. Uh, like, you know, this could just be an academic understanding of... Uh how tortured boogeymen are because that's important to be able to use against them which is really what eva's trying to do in this whole bit so you know like that's she's trying to goad reactions out of him Mm. uh and and keep him around yeah um yeah i I don't know i do like from andy's interlude i have sort of gotten the impression he cares like he would be a nice guy if he wasn't in such a shit situation and hadn't given up on it and i guess this is an example of that yeah um I mean, I mean, for me, the the juiciest part of this conversation was this idea Eva talks about, where the Mayans thought that the whole world was originally like the abyss, or pr- probably the whole universe, mm. and like gods and stuff started to give it shape, and and then humans uh, have added to that. Um, and I mean, I just love that because you know we know how important symbols and stuff are in pact, um, and that makes sense if this is a world that's just meaning sort of you know, cr- like clunkily built on top of chaos. Mm, yeah. Uh, like, I, I really I really like this idea that, you know, the the reason symbols and, and metaphors are so important in this world is because that's that's all the concept of the world is. Yeah. Like, you know, w- without that, it's just it's just the abyss. It's just chaos. Yeah, um, every symbol and- forges a connection that keeps you from sliding back down. Mm, yeah, exactly. And, I mean, it sort of makes you think, like, if... You can see why, like, you know, I went on a big rant last episode about how the right were designed to seemingly just keep this system in place and, and not rock the boat. And, and I mean, you know, if, if there was any awareness of how flimsy the underpinnings of the whole world are, um, I can see I can see more why you'd want to do that, you know. To, to tie it back to the whole, you know, practitioners as a metaphor for society type stuff, uh, you know, this layer of meaning that's enforced by the spirits and the practice and whatever is all that's standing between the world and like complete anarchy Mm. uh and and so that's sort of what the right is trying to fight against whereas blake's basically trying to say hey you know we've built a pretty solid foundation now we can we can improve on it Mm. yeah yeah interesting yeah i i I definitely like the idea of finding this out does add a level of risk to any uh world shattering change that people want to make um so we have to be careful of of you know how yeah. world shattering that change becomes um yeah yeah exactly so ava basically macgyvers herself together some ways to deal with blake um including flicking some lights on and off with mop handles is the impression i got um and yeah. and she also chucks some smoke grenades to kind of block uh, the 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 light from getting to the reflections, which then prevents Blake from going into them. Um, it's good stuff. Yeah, good one, Ava. You know, uh, Blake just kind of stood there and let her do it. Uh, yeah, not even he Blake. watched her. He watched her do it. Um, like he was so sort of busy trying to glean information from her, he just sort of watched her put this trap together and and hit him with it. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bad work, Blake. Um, I don't think he's got the, under- the 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 understanding that when you're in a standoff like this, you need to kind of make a play for yourself instead of just standing there and letting things happen. Um, but yeah, yeah. The interesting thing about this is this is Ava doing something that we would kind of traditionally think of as an Andy thing to do, right? Like putting together some, you know, assembling the things around her in order to put together some tricks and using some really clever ideas like the smoke grenades to block off his vision. Um, and we, I, I, I'd kind of pigeonholed Ava as just the fighting one, the one that's good at fighting, but it's not really right. It's, it's, I, I kind of see her more as like a tactical warrior, whereas Andy is like an engineer yeah. and researcher. Like, uh, she's, she's actually not just really good at fighting. She's got the brains to back up her brutality i guess yeah and i and i mean they talk about it in this chapter but i think they've talked about that in the past as well how eva makes the calls 
in the field and Andy makes the you know the more long term yeah. calls when they're not on the field. Uh and, and so it fits into that whole mentality, you know, it's it's the it's the guru type leadership versus the tailor type leadership, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um and it makes me think that I don't think if we if we compare Andy and Ever to Blake and Rose, I don't think Rose pl- plays enough of the long term planning angle. I think she makes plans, but I don't think she thinks about longer term things in the way that uh for example black lamb's blood kind of set up that practitioners sorry diabolists need to think about it and and maybe this kind of highlights a flaw in their dynamic is that they don't have someone who's really focused on the long term yeah i don't think she's experienced or knowledgeable enough to fit that role yet because that's really a role like i i think she she maybe has like the the right traits for that sort of role like like, in her character but she's not She's not versed enough to be fitting that role right now, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we kind of have seen her as the planner, but that really is just in contrast to Blake, I would say. Like, she kind of seems to have a regularly short to medium term level of planning ahead, whereas Blake is obviously just <laughs> immediate yeah. short term, which makes Rose feel like oh, a think... planner, but really she's not like a long term planner. Yeah, anyone's a long term planner when you put them with Blake. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And, and again, I think the being the long-term strategist really relies on having as much knowledge as possible. Yeah. I just don't think she's had time to accrue that yet. And yeah. what little time she did have, you know, most of it got memory wiped away. Yeah, true. That that would put a stop to any momentum you get, I guess. Yeah. Um, so Ava is able to get past Blake using her tricks and uh, Blake basically chases her upstairs uh, and, and he jumps into the bathroom where he finds Peter basically locked in the shower hiding. <laughs> um yeah and and so just briefly there's a number of moments coming up um yeah just address them all now where blake doesn't teleport where he expects to after disrupting a surface yeah and he's been pretty bang on about how that's worked up until now so this feels like something's changed and i don't know what i don't even have any tinfoil ideas about what but it feels like we're laying the seed to one of those things where in two chapters blake's gonna pull some move that i'm gonna be like what are you doing that's stupid but it turns out he's actually pieced this together uh, mm. and will reveal to it reveal it to us as he does it uh, um there were some really interesting comments about it and i'm gonna wait until we get towards the end of the episode and loop around to those comments okay. and talk about it more okay okay uh, yeah so <laughs> there's this bit earlier in the fight where ava talks about how um <laughs> how there's a bomb on one of the cabal hiding upstairs and later she she goes up to Andy and uh and Andy mentions that he's used all his bombs on the doors and windows and Ava's like shit and on the kid upstairs before they lock themselves up again <laughs> and Andy's like Doctor, he's got it there's yeah. an ellipsis here and he goes yeah um <laughs> <laughs> it's just so transparent <laughs> It's like the most, <laughs> like, bless Andy's heart for trying to play along, but Ava really set him up to fail here. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's classic. it's a pretty good comedy moment. Like, it's just, <laughs> you, you're just like, oh, right, oh, Ava, okay. Yeah, it's really Like, up good. until then, I was honestly believing her. Like, I, I thought it was real. And then you read this and you're like, oh, okay. Okay, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's great because i mean she doesn't know that blake's listening but he is and and of course he i mean he kind of interestingly he doesn't seem to pick up on it but later in the chapter he kind of puts together that she's been lying to him (laughs) yeah no he does that sort of classic blake thing where he he doesn't seem to process it until he's doing the thing that he's doing yeah um Wait, wait, you know, it's like I was talking about what I'm expecting with this teleporting weirdness. Like, he just tends yeah. to... He pockets these things away and then only connects the dots for us as he's putting it into motion. Yeah, um, totally. But yeah, no, with this Eva bit, you can just imagine her... Because, yeah, she doesn't know Blake's there, but you can imagine her looking around the room as she says it. Like, uh, you know... Uh, and, and, and looking the for the puddles. Upstairs and she's like... Yeah, <laughs> just sort of looking around the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's classic. Um, Andy and Ava have a little bit of a tiff where Ava's kind of upset that Andy's doing stuff without take, directly taking orders from her, or that he's kind of giving her ideas on what she should do when she's meant to be the the one that calls the shots when they're in the field. And it's, I mean, and eventually Andy's like, just call the shots, and the shot she calls is, of course, the thing that he already said, which is, I think, <laughs> ev- like a trope that is only ever used to show how 
childish and kind of incompetent the the person who wants to call the shots is and it's just like it's so immature like god i hate her so much elliot she she actually drives me crazy <laughs> yeah i know oh uh, i think she's great fun um uh, but yeah like i totally agree this is entirely a point like that's brought up to just sort of show us how like you, you know silly she is like you know because uh, i think i think that's going to be a factor moving forward considering how the chapter ends yeah oh yeah yeah definitely we'll get to that in a moment um and so andy threatens to cut the power and blake's response is well i i'll oh yeah i'll do it better um and gets the thorburns to turn off the power uh, no it is a good plan though because it it clearly is confusing enough to andy yeah, that it, it gives them an opportunity to catch him which they do uh, and they take him immediately as a hostage and so there are multiple times in this chapter where blake pops in to like check in on or update peter mm. and he like scares the shit out of him every time he enters the yeah. room which of course you know not free little boosts for blake it's good, yep, little good power boost. yep um but i am noticing a pattern where it, like, it's it's almost like the more momentum blake has the more he does this and doesn't even seem to realize that he's doing it mm. like it was the same with tiff after his fight with alistair it's sort of uh he he's it almost feels like the more he's on a roll the less he's noticing when his boogeyman tendencies take over yeah i i get the which, sense uh, is not a good it's, it's concerning yeah it, it makes me feel like he once he gets this momentum he kind of lets himself forget that he's trying to not be a boogeyman <laughs> like he just kind of goes yeah. with the flow more um yeah once he gets rolling he uh he can't put on the brakes yeah definitely um and okay there's this really interesting bit where blake is talking to peter and trying to sum him up and he sums him up as the combination of two people who are the opportunist and the coward and then says to i mean this this line is just so well written i love it blake says you should get a chance to beat that guy's face in i told the opportunist which is such a good way of expressing Mm. like blake is intentionally trying to manipulate peter in this very specific way and it totally works in fact it works too well based on what happens next (laughs) um yeah no i completely agree it's a it's a nice well-written line that tells us what blake is doing without him having to actually tell us yeah it's awesome um so yeah they take andy hostage and peter comes at him with a toilet a ceramic toilet lid and fucking brains him like this is i felt like i felt this off the page as i read the line yeah. i kind of physically recoiled um yeah yeah i love I, and i think i think that's the writing i love how this is written because blake is sort of holding andy down and then sort of gets shunted as this as there's the lead up to this yeah so he basically gets transported to the other side of the corridor and just gets to like see and he hears it and he feels it from across the room and i love how like powerful it is that he's sort of seeing it from across the room and and Mm. feeling it that far away yeah yeah um and i it's i don't know how i feel about this i mean like it 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 kind of is in between two things to me where this is kind of the coldness that you need to be effective in this world. And so in that sense, Peter does well here. But also, it represents a kind of brutality that Blake has intentionally tried to stay away from until he absolutely had to. And that's kind of the reason why the Thorburns aren't such a great idea, right? It's because they, they, especially, you know, some of them, Roxanne, um, seem to just be so much more willing to... (laughs) <laughs> to to play into the eye for an eyeness, and and that's really the problem with this world, right? Is if you just play into an eye for an eye, yeah. everything gets fucked up. And and Blake is very intentionally trying to not do that. Yeah, exactly. It's it's my biggest concern with Peter because Peter's jumping into the world as it exists right now way yeah. too easily. Blake needs people who are going to help him fight against this. Yeah. Um. In, in saying that, I don't really want to hold what Peter's done here against him. Because, <laughs> yeah, no, it. I mean, these two are like, horribly like attacking them. Like it's a, it's clearly yeah. self like justifiable. But I don't in know. the last in the last fifteen minutes, he's been attacked, like bombed, uh, mm-hmm. found out magic is real. Yep. Like you know, I get it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not holding it against him. I just. It just feels like I'm holding it against Blake. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's totally Blake's <laughs> fault. Yeah. Um, so, of course, Andy is uh, knocked unconscious, and Ava shows up and is, uh, yeah, quietly brutal here, kind of cold. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting to contrast it to when Roxanne tried to stab 
Andy and failed. Ava went kind of rage mode, right? Whereas here she doesn't. She goes cold and basically flips out on them. Yeah, well, it's like the next level, you know, when somebody gets yeah. so angry that there's almost a calm to it. Yeah. That's that's where she's at right now. Like, they've gone too far now. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and she, like, I love how she does this whole fight just with a hand grenade. Yeah, this hand grenade is great. Like, I, I could imagine that on the Practitioner Times, the headline being, Psychopath takes out two Thorburns with one grenade, and you won't believe how she does it. It's brutal. Like, it's brutal. She, <laughs> she, not only does she give Blake a hand grenade as an att- like she just kind of drops it on him like here you go she uses that hand grenade and yeah. fucking beats the shit out of Peter with it as a kind of bludgeoning weapon like it's 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 yeah. insane and I mean look I'm not an explosives expert but I can't imagine that's a smart thing to be doing with a grenade yeah but but it it works perfectly right as in yeah yeah she it, nails it. it goes exactly how she wants it to go there, there's no indication that that she even, like, you kind of really, and it, this echoes what I was saying at the start of the chapter, you really get the sense that she just knows how this works. She knows how fighting works, and she's able to make these smart plays that she knows people will have to respond to in certain ways to just mean that she really effectively and kind of handily wins this fight. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. She she kicks ass, basically. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's this interesting moment where, uh, you know, Blake is given the grenade and has to escape to get rid of it so that he doesn't blow himself and the house up. Um, and he, he goes and he, I'll, I'll read it out. He says, he thinks, I hurled the grenade into the great expanse of darkness between patches of light. It found a patch of light far away from Hillsglade House instead, skipping across darkness much as I might have. And I, 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 I this kind of stood out to me. I don't know if I, if we knew that this was a thing that happened in the mirror world, like items that no, Blake I don't think throws... We did. Yeah, like they they also have the same properties he does, where they pass through darkness kind of instantaneously. I I, I see this being some an, a a feature of the mirror world that is going to be munchkinable for Blake to do some interesting shenanigans at some point, and I'm excited for that point to happen. Yeah, I I agree. This this is going to be a mechanic that gets used later on. I think it, it's funny when we first found out Blake was in the mirror at the start of Arc Ten. I was sort of like, oh, he'll only be in here for like two arcs. It's it's too limiting. You know, you can't just you can't just have him in here for half the fucking story. Mm. Um, I'm not so sure anymore. I actually genuinely believe he might be in the mirrors till maybe right at the end. Um, like Wildbo is so unafraid to write himself well to write himself into corners like this. It's it's really impressive. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, we'll see, I guess. Um, yeah, it is interesting though. It's interesting the amount of depth that this mirror world has been able to provide to the story. Like it's, it's changed the way Blake interacts with the world so much that it's kind of made everything fresh again at, from arc 10, you know? Yes. But I think like if, if I was to write this, mm. we, we'd run out of interesting things to do with it within about three chapters. Yeah. Um, it's so impressive that Wildbo's managed to keep it going on this long, and, and I get the impression a fair bit longer. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It, it is quite impressive. Um, so, okay, so Peter's taken out by Ava. Um, Blake is there, kind of in a little bit of a, a standoff, uh, and Ava is basically forced to guard Andy. Um, Blake tells her that he's not going to let her escape with Andy, so she's going to have to stay here and make sure that he's safe, which means, you know, in a minute or two when the monsters come, she's going to be trapped in here and she's going to have to fight her way out to help them in order to get Andy out as well, um, which is... Slumber party. Great. It's Yeah, it's great. Um, I, I love this idea. I love the idea of Ava being forced to be on side with the Thorburns because, like, obviously I hate her guts, but she's... We, she has proven herself to be so good at fighting that this is really the only way I can see them having any semblance of a chance. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, this is such a good, this is such a good plan by Blake. Like, this is this is actually the best play uh, of of the day. Um, and I mean, uh, like, I I know this is a bit of a stretch, but just just let me have it. Like, it, he Blake is kind of bouncing back the witch hunters in a way you know like we've seen how mm. when a practitioner sends something out it gets bounced back and it's stronger be interesting, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that's how the witch hunters kind of work here like they've been sent to the thorburns and blake has kind of bent eva onto having to be on his side now and i wonder if that's going to be a good thing yeah i i i definitely see that like it definitely kind of makes sense as an interesting little parallel um i wonder 
I mean, I just know that Ava is going to kick some serious monster butt <laughs> as we continue through the yes. story, and I can't wait for it. Well, it feels like what we were saying about how the Thorburns, you know, when they're a team, when they work together, they're very effective, but they might, they'll stab each other in the back first chance they get. I feel like Eva's basically just having another Thorburn on side. She's going to continue to work with them while it's in the common interest. Yeah. But they, they'd they better be afraid the the second that the sun starts to come up. Yeah, or even if Andy wakes up. Like, they're going to have to make sure that they just give him the old uh, toilet <laughs> lid every once in a while to make sure that he doesn't go back to fighting shape um, and they can just escape. I think from the description uh, of, of how his head's doing, I don't know if he's going to be waking up within, within 12 hours. I actually think that might be safe there. He sounded pretty fucked up. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. Um, I, I I had this thought as well that, uh, Blake's kind of assumed that the monsters are really indiscriminate. And we know that Ava's not a great liar, but if she bluffed him here and was like, yeah, sure they are, but actually they won't attack her and she's just able to completely fuck him over, <laughs> I think that would be quite funny, but I don't think it will happen, hopefully. Yeah. I don't want that to happen because I'm much, as a spirit, I'm much more interested in, in watching her have to work with them than uh, the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, this this chapter did spend a solid amount of time characterizing Eva, like, specifically. Like, we had the whole first half was a conversation between her and Blake and um and all that. So, yeah, like, it, it'd be silly to, to have her go away now, I think. It, I, I want to see more of her. Me too. I want to see her kick more butt because she's really good at it. <laughs> um, and that's the end of our chapter. That's the end of 11.11. Yeah, so for our bonus bit this, uh, this chapter, we've decided to do another comment deep dive because... Uh, you know, this is the sort of chapter that I think really gets people talking in a fun way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I always love checking out the comments from five years ago. They always bring up a lot of interesting things to think on. Uh, the comments yeah. I pulled out were, there, there seemed to be a lot of comments that were kind of theory crafting about this thing that you mentioned where Blake kept getting pulled to different places than he expected. And a few people kind of figured out it always seemed to be he was going down towards the ground more than expected, as in towards the basement. Um, which led to a lot of people theorizing hmm. that it was the drains kind of exerting a pull on him, kind of pulling him down for some reason. Um, and and, and hmm. as we, as as it's been explained to us, the drains do have a hold on him and will reclaim him if he doesn't make enough of a mark on the world. So maybe there's maybe the drains are unhappy with him. I mean, maybe the drains are unhappy with him waking up the Thorburns. Uh, I I I don't know, but I think that's interesting to keep an eye on. Yeah, that's that's an interesting theory. Um, I mean, what that sort of made me think, I, I hadn't made the connection that it's always downward. I wonder if that has more to do with the fact that they were water reflections. Mm. You know, because he, he mentioned last chapter when he was, or maybe even the chapter before when he was in the oil, how dry it was on his end. Like, mm. I wonder if what he's being reflected through has some sort of impact on the, the world that he's in. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I can see that happening. I don't know. I'm very interested to see where we go with this. I, I don't really have any solid ideas. <laughs> yeah, just, I know. I, it's, I just want to know. It's the kind of thing where we know... I feel like this beat is going to get repeated multiple times throughout later chapters. And for this first one, it's really hard to see where it's going. But just it's it just feels like it's going in an interesting direction. Yeah, I know it's going somewhere cool. I just have no idea where that is. Um, so I pulled out a comment by Sir Fuente. And it's just a really good comment. So I'm going to read out the whole thing uh, verbatim. Okay. Um, so, uh, Sir Fuente says, Blake, the Thorburn boogeyman, is a being born through the power of darkness. It's only through facing Ur that he was able to change his nature and unlock his potential. Interestingly enough, this creature, who is the result of dark, constantly finds himself reliant on the light. It is only from the light god that Blake escaped Ur's dark. Without light, Blake loses his, foot world, his foothold into the real world. Blake's world, however, is one filled with dark. One could say that Blake lives in, in, in constant twilight. Perhaps Blake's true nature doesn't deal with birds or trees or even mirrors. Perhaps his is a nature dealing with balance. Just as Blake is a creature reliant on wielding both light and dark, he affects the world for both right and wrong. He sees a world that is cruel, unfair, and wishes to change it. He, went, yeah, he wants to make a better world, a balanced one, without the extremes that currently exist. He even repurposed the core elements of the world, his, the spirits, to this end. Whether Blake realizes it or not, yeah, whether Blake realizes it or not, he has found his place in the world. Blake will bring balance. Mm. And I mean, I really like this because this circles around so many ideas we've talked about, uh, even recently with regards to right versus wrong, um, and, and tying that to light and dark imagery is really fun. Um, 
you know, we've sort of been talking about how it seems to us that the best way for Blake to go ahead would be to try and adjust the system. You know, you don't want to completely break it. You don't want to leave it as is. You got to try and fix it. And that's sort of exactly where Sir Fuente is. So I really like this. Yeah, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting comment. You're right. I, I do quite like it. I like the idea of Blake as this kind of, uh, I don't know, avatar, I guess, serving to to kind of balance the world. I wonder, though, what that implies for the trajectory of the story. Like, we kind of see Blake moving more towards Boogeyman, and we do have these notes of things like the the conquest for Lordship of Jacob's Bell. And I'm curious what the interpretation of, if this is the theme that is trying to be played at, what what is the balanced version of what happens? Because I don't see breaking the wheel as balance it feels too disruptive no and i mean i mentioned that a few episodes ago i think where i I sort of said you know blake's ideas are great and all but like he hasn't suggested an alternative he knows he wants to break the wheel but um like i I don't know like you're gonna have an easier time convincing people to break the wheel if you're suggesting better ideas like black lamb's oh and and maybe eventually his thesis will be what black lamb's blood said what if it's like Um, what if it's we've been talking about blaking the wheel and it, obviously that's a game of thrones reference right what if it what if it what if the balance that blake seeks is a kind of game of thrones esque council of elders of jacob's bell and each of the family gets one member on the council and they vote in someone who has the best story and that person becomes <laughs> king <laughs> God, not again. Please, not again. <laughs> and who would um, it be? Who would be the shittiest person to elect? <laughs> In true Game of Thrones style, who would be the shittiest person to elect? Oh, no, I know. It's, Pordrick. If Pordrick, that's good. Uh, maybe Peter. Peter is the new <laughs> the new Lord of Jacob's Fell. Maybe. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, no, I, yeah, I'm very interested to see what direction Blake actually tries to take things as he tries to shatter the system mm. because, uh, I mean, yeah, there's no guarantees that he'll try and make a better one. And in fact, like... I'd I'd love it. I'd love for there to be a twist. You know, I've talked about how I expect the lawyers to maybe come in towards the end of the story and try to capitalize on anything. And like, you know, if he creates less stability in an attempt to create a new like stand, status quo, that would be the perfect time for the lawyers to come in and try and just make it full on anarchy or whatever their goal actually is. Mm. Uh, I guess we have to see, right? We have to see how it goes. Yes. Um, and that's the end of our our episode discussing uh, Malfeasance eleven eleven. Make a wish. Um, thanks for joining us, folks. If you have a wish uh, or anything that you want to share with us, uh, you can do so by leaving it in the discussion thread, which will be linked in the episode description down below. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Deep Impact, we've got Ward. Not vowed of you, uh, what you say, <laughs> uh, or any of the other shows on the Doof Media Network, head on over to doofmedia.com, yeah. and that's where all the information is. Yeah. It's all there. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what websites are for. Um, It's a good place for it. Yep. Uh, You can find all the info on all the great shows. Uh, You can also find out how to vote on the fan art contest. You can find all the entries and vote for your favorite entry uh, with an asterisk there, because in order to vote, you need to be a patron of Doof Media, um, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash Doof Media. Yes. And of course, we've said it before, and we're going to keep saying it. Until until you know you you, you give him the money that you until can the abyss to give. claims us all. <laughs> uh, Wabo has a Patreon. Sorry, this bit's gone and got it away from me. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Wabo. <laughs> you go there, you give him the money. It's it's good. It's not an outro to our show unless the bits get away from us, <laughs> Elliot. That's the core staple of our outros. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, okay. So we'll see everyone for Malfeasance yep. Eleven X on Monday, the seventh of October. An interlude. Exciting. Uh, we'll see you all then. 